Seafloor Spreading and Mapping the Seafloor by Joshua Norwood, Spencer Fish, and Molly Brand. How inappropriate to call this planet Earth when it is quite clearly ocean by Arthur C. Clarke. So much attention is focused on the land we live on. Humanity's existence has been spent on trying to understand and tame the land while sometimes neglecting its surrounding waters. Our world is still such a mysterious place. We have only just begun to uncover its secrets. We have learned our world as we know it has changed drastically in its lifetime and is still changing today. Our oceans play a key part in this change. This video will explain what part the ocean and its seafloor has in shaping our world. One question we can ask ourselves is, where do these changes occur? To answer our initial question of where these changes occur, we claim that the seafloor spreading changes occur at the ridges on the ocean floor and expand outward. So how do we know where these changes took place? Harry Hess, a geology professor at Princeton University, also served in the Navy Reserves. During his time in World War II, he participated in ocean surveying. He discovered huge mountain ranges at depths of the ocean. It was not flat, looking like a wasteland like many people had thought. He also took many core samples of the ocean floor. He discovered that the materials found near the ridges and mountain ranges were much younger than the ones found further away from these mountain ranges. So, what does this evidence prove? We now understand that new plate materials are formed at these ridges. Molten rock flows from the underwater volcanoes and cools at the top. This new material pushes the older material further away. Therefore, it spreads out from the ridges. Answering this question raises some others as well. How has this phenomenon changed how the world looks? How will it keep changing, and what will the world look like in the future due to this phenomenon? Our second researchable question is, how long does seafloor spreading take? To investigate this question, we used resources such as the NSTA Learning Center, the National Geographic website, the NOAA website, and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography website. Our claim is that the seafloor spread apart at a rate of between 1 and 20 centimeters per year at divergent plate boundaries between tectonic plates. The seafloor exhibits magnetic striping, or alternating stripes of normal polarity with a sphere, which is aligned with Earth's current magnetic field, and stripes of reverse polarity, which are opposite the current magnetic field. Because the mid-ocean ridges act as lines of symmetry with regards to the magnetic stripes, we know that both sides of the ridge are spreading at the same rate. The age of rock can be determined by using radiometric dating. Certain radioactive isotopes occur in known abundances, and scientists have determined the half-lives of these isotopes or the amount of time it takes for one half of the material to decompose into more stable materials. By analyzing the abundance of these radioactive isotopes and the materials they are known to decay into, scientists can tell with precision how old a piece of rock is. Isotopes of uranium and potassium are generally used to determine the age of rock. Using radiometric dating, scientists determine that oceanic crust is up to 200 million years old near the continental oceanic boundaries, but only a few million years old near the mid-ocean ridges. Using these numbers, as well as how wide the ocean is, scientists could determine how quickly the oceanic crust must be spreading from the center of the ocean. For the Atlantic Ocean, this rate was determined to be approximately 5 centimeters per year, while it was approximately 15 centimeters per year in the Pacific Ocean. Scientists were also able to gather supporting evidence by comparing the ages of continental rocks from each period of magnetic reversal to the ages of oceanic crust from each period of magnetic reversal. The ages from each period matched up, giving further support to the claim. Some other questions that came up during the research were, why is it that some seafloor spreading seems to occur more quickly than others, for example, the difference between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans? Will the oceans get bigger over time? or smaller, or will the creation of new crust be completely cancelled out by subduction where oceanic crust meets continental crust? And are tectonic plates and seafloor spreading unique to Earth, or do other moons or planets also exhibit this kind of activity? Previously in this video, we have used seafloor maps to show the presence of mid-ocean ridges and mid-ocean mountain ranges. In this portion of the video, we will look at how scientists use the data gathered to create seafloor maps. 
All early mapping of the seafloor was done with a form of sounding lines. Sounding lines are ropes with weights at the end that sailors or oceanographers lower until the weight touches the bottom and the line goes slack. These ropes have specific lengths. Using the known lengths of the ropes, scientists are able to record the depths of the seafloor. After scientists record the depth of the ocean floor, they retract the rope and move forward to the next point, and repeat the process of dropping the rope until it goes slack to record the next point of data. During World War II, a piece of technology was invented called sonar. Sonar not only allowed ships to detect the location of other ships or submarines, but could also show the position of land and the seafloor. The Navy used sonar to map the depth of the seafloor, allowing submarines to travel more safely through the oceans. During World War II, the Navy funded many civilian scientists to help map out portions of the seafloor. The technique of using sonar to map the seafloor is called echo sounding. The illustration shown is an example of echo sounding. Ships fired pulses of sound at the seafloor and recorded the time it took to bounce back up. The time of the ping gave the depth of the water at that location. Technology today has remained relatively unchanged in the way we map the seafloor. By combining various echo soundings into maps, scientists started to see what the ocean floor looked like for the first time. They saw that it was not a flat barren landscape as previously thought, but covered with ridges and mountain ranges. At first, scientists were amazed, but quickly turned skeptical. The map suggested seafloor spreading. Seafloor spreading was part of a theory called continental drift, that had already been rejected by many scientists. By mapping the seafloor, scientists were able to gather data. That data would eventually be used to confirm the theory of continental drift. So in review, we asked ourselves, what causes the seafloor to change over time? We then had to ask, where do the changes occur? Which brought up questions like, how has this phenomenon changed how the world looks? And how will it keep changing? What will the world look like in the future? We also asked ourselves, how long does seafloor spreading take? Why is it that some seafloor spreading seems to occur more quickly than others? And will oceans get bigger or smaller over time? Or will the creation of new crust be completely canceled out by subduction where ocean crust meets continental crust? Are tectonic plates and seafloor spreading unique to Earth? Or do other moons and planets also exhibit this kind of activity?